On behalf of the National Eczema Association, I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar Wednesday presentation, Eczema and Aging. I'm your host, Danny Morsehead. I am the Marketing and Communications Manager here at the National Eczema Association. And today our presenter is Dr. Eric Simpson. Dr. Simpson is a board certified dermatologist and professor of dermatology and director of clinical research at Oregon Health and Science University. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Simpson. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I guess there's Taco Tuesday, now there's Webinar Wednesday. Um, and I'm wondering why they picked me to talk about aging and eczema. I think it's because I just got my AARP card. So I think I appreciate my, and I'm being absolutely serious about that. And so I appreciate the opportunity. Let me just share my screen. <clears throat> I think I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Okay, give me a verbal yes. You got. You can see my uh, title slide, please. Looks good. Okay, and I'm gonna bother the um, uh, our organizers. A, hey, thank you for inviting me, and thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, and I'm gonna allow you guys just to ask questions throughout the, the presentation. You don't have to wait to the end. I kind of like interactive. And there's not that many of you on, um, so if you have questions. You can unmute potentially and or just put them in the chat and then Danny, just raise your hand, or not raise your hand, just stop me verbally uh, and let me know. Okay, so we're gonna talk about eczema and aging. Um, I do, I'll be talking about some medications, I think, um, that I, I'm an investigator and consultant for. I don't do any like promotional speaking. I'm just very interested in doing clinical trials and trying to find new medications for patients. And I don't know if you've heard this yet, but I will not be talking about anti-aging products. It kind of stinks, actually, if you do have atopic dermatitis or for my patients with sensitive skin, uh, it's hard to, to find anti-aging products, but, and they don't work anyway. So you're gonna be able to save money and they don't work anyway, very well. The retinoids kind of do, um, but they, they're a little bit irritating, so, you could potentially use them about maybe every other day or something with a lot of moisturizer, but don't waste your money on a lot of this other stuff because it doesn't it doesn't really work. Collagen and stem cells and vitamin C, none, none of that really works uh, for anti-aging, I'm sorry. So sunscreen, that works. And then my other major comment is this. I know you guys don't agree with me that retirement kind of stinks, um, but it does if you have eczema. So we're going to be talking about um, our older population with eczema and how that can really ruin retirement, unfortunately. But we're going to get beyond that and we're going to enjoy retirement because we're going to get our eczema under control and figure out what the heck is going on. All right, so here's the over overview. We'll be talking about skin aging and maybe why aging skin can increase your risk for eczema. Um, how common is eczema in older adults? Does it really happen? We always think about it being a childhood disease. Uh, I think the biggest challenge and actually the biggest um, risk and threat uh, is the proper diagnosis. And so in kids, if you have a rash and a family history of atopy, for example, asthma, hey, hey, it's like almost always gonna be eczema. But when you're older and you have eczema, there's a lot of other things you can you need to think about for the diagnosis. So I really think the diagnosis part is, is one of the most important parts of this talk. And then of course, a lot of you unfortunately understand the challenge of living with the, with the condition either your whole life or it went away for a while, then it comes back. Like what the heck, why is it coming back? So we'll talk about some of those challenges and then challenges in treatment and some final thoughts. Okay, so I want you to just get on the page of like what causes atopic dermatitis and let you look under the hood, look at, let you look at the skin. This is normal skin if you do a cross section of a biopsy and you stain it so you can see stuff. And the very, that basket weave top is the, is what's called the stratum corneum. That's like the dead skin cells, but they're really important for making the seal on the top of your skin. Uh, and then you have your epidermis, that second layer, that's a, that's a live um, and uh, replicating. And then you have your dermis, all that pink 
fibrillar kind of uh, wavy stuff. That's all your collagen and you have some immune cells in there. And so skin with eczema, it looks different. Like it's, it's not, it has all these holes. It's like lots of edema and inflammation in your epidermis uh, and allows water to leave your skin. Ear tends to enter the skin and it irritate it and inflame it into even more. You have more of these immune cells, all those little blue dots are immune cells that are secreting all these chemicals that cause itch and uh, further redness and swelling and uh, all that inflammation and all these chemicals in the skin coming from those immune cells. And so your stratum corneum becomes disorganized, your epidermis has this edema and you have all this inflammation. And then you have all those chemicals I talked about, the interleukins. And we know now that interleukin 4 and 13 are really important chemical messengers that lead to eczema and, and promote eczema. And so we can block those specifically with some of our targeted treatments. And so we think about it as two, I always think about it as two major things going on. I got a dry skin barrier genetically and environmentally if I you know shower too hot to put too much soap on or as I age I start getting drier so that's one hint of maybe why eczema might start coming on as you get older so aging skin gets drier uh, but then you, there's also this immune activation uh, aspect and there's this that has also has a genetic underpinning and so if you have a if you have the genes for too much inflammation and the genes for kind of dry skin, that's a that's going to lead probably to someone who's very at risk for eczema, for atopic dermatitis. And here's that kind of here's that what it looks like with your eyes, that you know red skin, uh, that in, that that inflammation, that dryness, that flakiness, that disorganized top part of your skin. That's that's all you see all of those uh, in this uh, young patient with atopic dermatitis. And so what does aging do in this whole, you know, overlay on, on this pathophysiology, this cause of eczema? What is, what's, how does aging affect that? Well, on your left is transepidermal water loss. That means like how leaky your skin is. Actually, your skin becomes less leaky over time. So actually your skin barrier in some ways gets better with age. And so that's not really a risk factor, I'd say, on your left. On your right, I'd say, is the bigger risk factor. And there's a, and that's a lipid your lipid levels decrease in the skin. So the, the fats, the lipids that make a nice skin barrier, that very top stratum corneum, that starts changing and decreasing over time. So your skin barrier does become uh, a little bit more disorganized with age. And so moisture, moisturizers and things with ceramides could potentially reverse that. So, um, so there's a, several products out there from Eucerin to Neutrogena to CeraVe to Cetaphil that have uh, nice lipids to use to hopefully prevent flare-ups of atopic dermatitis. And so then it's not just the skin barrier though. Remember it was the infl inflammation. So in the, your immune system changes over time and some of it is good. You don't need to look at, I'm not gonna go through all these. I just want you to take what the take home being, my immune system changes over time. And it actually changes in ways that promote eczema type inflammation. Uh, and so there's a whole bunch of, you can find in any part comp compartment of the body how your immune system changes. Um, but overall, you have a, uh, I would call it dysregulated. Uh, so you might lose some of your natural immunity to infection, whatnot. So some of that decreases, but it's also just like the regulation of your immune system is a little bit altered over time. So it's not just decreased, it's actually not regulated properly. Um, and, and you actually have an increase in some certain cells and a decrease in others. And so that can make it uh, a little bit more hyperactive. Um, so that combination of uh, decreased lipids in your skin and an altered immune system that's a little bit more hyperactive and doesn't function quite right, that can also promote potentially, just theoretically, atopic dermatitis. And this was a nice review article that just kind of went through some of those. N none of this, these findings are really like super proven to cause eczema in our older adults. Um, but they're all just kind of 
features of eczema that happen also in aging. So, uh, so physical skin barrier changes, your immune system changes. Uh, you can you itch more than average because of dry skin, because of other medications potentially. Uh, you can get more microbial colonization because of that reduction in, in your primitive immune system. Uh, and then there may be other um, factors that impact your risk, such as certain medications can promote more dry skin or promote more inflammation. Uh, and then exposure and additional allergies that you might develop over time. So all of these can, can, can contribute to that risk of atopic dermatitis in our older adults, which, like I said, we really just think about it as a childhood disease. So how common is it? Are you, you know, are you and my patients the only ones getting this? Is it a common disorder? Is it uncommon? Well, let's first think about adults with atopic dermatitis. So we hadn't thought about older adults. What about just plain old adults? And it turns out if you look at 17 different studies, a quarter uh, of adults with atopic dermatitis, it started as an adult, not as a kid. So there is such a thing as adult onset atopic dermatitis. We do not know uh, really much about older adult onset atopic dermatitis. Uh, but they do look a little bit different. It's not it's not in the classic like kid places and your creases of your arm or behind your knees. It's usually a uh, neck, a uh, trunkal uh, involvement. And so that's what's confusing, especially when you if you have an older adult starting with atopic dermatitis, sometimes you get misdiagnosed or the diagnosis takes a long time to make, which I'm sure some of you have experienced. This was a really nice study by Katrina Abuabara. She's a um, dermatologist at UCSF, and she looked at um, codes in the UK system, and they, they, they have really nice medical records. And you can see on the left, which is the younger age, it's up to 18% prevalence, meaning 18% of kids have atopic dermatitis. It drops over time, but then look, look after 60, you start seeing it increasing again. So there's something about being over 60 that starts increasing your risk of atopic dermatitis. And we've never thought about that before. So these are kind of new findings. This is from 2019. So I think we've missed the boat or we have this blind spot uh, in our older adults that have this um, have just as severe disease uh, as our kids. So. Why did we have this blind spot? And I think part of it is because of the diagnosis and part of it is because it, we've always had this bias that's a pediatric disease. And one, even one of the criteria for um, diagnosing atopic dermatitis, I know this is hard to read, uh, but if you look at the minor criteria, so it's the second paragraph, the blue, in the, you know, like the blue, the, the title minor criteria. Uh, let's see, about six of them down, it's early age of onset. So that's one of the criteria for diagnosing atopic dermatitis. And then there's also the flexural involvement, meaning in the creases of your arms and legs is also a major criterion for diagnosing. I, I, and I find in our older adults that they often don't have those findings. And so you're missing some of these, you know, these, these criteria were based on kids and younger adults. So we may, we, we may need more uh, specific criteria for diagnosing atopic dermatitis uh, for, older, for older patients. And there's a lot of other eczemas that happen, maybe don't happen as much in young kids, but happen in older patients. Uh, and I'll show you some pictures of these mimickers of atopic dermatitis. So something called numular dermatitis. Numular means coin. So coin-shaped eczema is a whole different diagnosis than atopic dermatitis. Uh, allergic contact dermatitis, something you're getting allergic uh, that you put on your skin. Xerotic, I'll show you a picture of that. It's dry skin eczema. And then we have patients with itching without a rash. And so it actually does kind of drive me a little bit nuts uh, when I see um, dermatologists stand on stage and say, that person has uh, elderly elderly itch and we have a whole we have a whole symposium on elderly itch and 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 I feel like that really misses the point because there's about a thousand causes of itch and the most important thing when you think about itch is 
is it coming from a rash like eczema or is it coming from something else like liver disease kidney disease uh, blood count problems a whole bunch of other internal problems and so as a dermatologist when i hear an older patient come in I, i'm really itchy doctors that drive me crazy i really have to use my observational skills to say is there a rash there or is there not a rash there and sometimes the skin's so scratched up, it's hard to see if there's really a rash or not. So when you report to your providers, uh, it's very helpful for you, for us to be able to hear from you, like did, did it start as a red rash or a bumpy rash or a, a scaly rash and that itched? Or is it just, do you have itch alone? And uh, then drug reactions can look like eczema. And then there's a type of cancer, a malignancy of lymph cells, of, of your immune cells called cutaneous T-cell lymphoma and mycosis fungoides. And the scary thing about this, so the good news is it's about one in a million in terms of prevalence, so it's extremely rare. The second good news is if it's in your skin only, your prognosis is great. You're gonna, you're gonna die with the disease, not from the disease. Um, uh, but the, so those are the good things. The scary thing is biopsies of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma look like eczema and the red is eczema by the best pathologists. And so it's something that evolves over time. Uh, and so when you're, if you're an older adult with, uh, with evolving eczema, changing eczema, eczema that's not responding, sometimes repeated biopsies over time are necessary to make sure you don't have this rare mimicker of atopic dermatitis. And then there's a whole basket, a uh, waste basket full of, of eczemas of the, of the elderly with these different names. I personally, my bias is that they all have atopic dermatitis most likely, but I'll show you kind of a sampling of that. Okay, so what's this now that you're a dermatologist, at least a older adult, eczema dermatologist. Uh, remember the name for the round lesions? Yep, good. Uh, Coin-shaped lesions, numular eczema. Kind of weird, right? It's like just so distinctive. But it's really made up of tiny little eczema bumps. So if you looked at any one of those in isolation, you could see, oh, it looks like my eczema. But when you look at it from afar, it's like these round, circular, uh, lesions, and that's its own diagnosis. It's, you, you can see this in patients with atopic dermatitis, but it's also its own diagnosis. It has nothing to do with atopic dermatitis potentially. So these are the close-up, very unique disorder. Another one that can mimic atopic dermatitis is, is a picture, not on the right. On the right, maybe it looks like numular dermatitis, but it's not. That's the testing for allergic contact dermatitis. That's called patch testing. Uh, but on your left, if someone comes in, new onset eczema, uh, this happened to be a case report that we uh, wrote on um, Tom's of Maine deodorant causing allergic contact dermatitis. And that was, and so most of my patients say, well, you know, it's all natural. How could it possibly be a problem? Um, but that, you know, I, then I say, well, so it's poison oak. Uh, and, um, and this was the lichen acid uh, in, in the Tom's of Maine deodorant that caused this eruption. So this person was allergic to that chemical that natural chemical. And this is that when I was a resident 20 years ago, this is a study, of, one of the first studies of botanical allergic contact dermatitis. So anything that you put on your skin, even natural or unnatural or things you've used for a long time, you know, uh, neosporin for 30 years, that can still cause allergic contact dermatitis. And especially when you have eczema, uh, because you're, you're um, exposing your skin and your immune system to multiple topicals. Um, topical therapies and all of them could potentially cause allergic contact dermatitis. So you don't know until you get tested. And then another mimicker is, uh, this is called xerotic dermatitis. So this patient was so dry, he was getting eczema. And I was like, why would, I usually see this on the front of the shins. Like I get this, all of us get it in the winter time. If the heater's on and you're getting in the a hot shower, drying your skin out. Um, so you usually see this on the front of the, of the shins. This guy had it on his whole body. I said, like, what are you doing that's like, uh, that you could be getting so dry? And he said, he's getting in and out of the hot tub 10 times a day, no moisturizer, no anything. So he was just like 
crushing his skin and you get this kind of funny looking dry sca uh, scallopy scale. So that's xerotic dermatitis that could be confused for atopic dermatitis. And then drug eruptions. So sometimes, you know, widespread drug eruptions on the left is a what we call morbilliform. It's measles-like drug eruption. You wouldn't confuse that for atopic dermatitis, but you might confuse a different type of drug eruption. Uh, this uh, eczematous drug eruption, biopsy shows eczema. But it's still, I think the vast majority, let me see if I have a slide of this, the vast majority of patients who have adult or elderly onset eczema, uh, we just did a study, we just finished a study, we haven't published it yet, we presented it at, the, at, at a recent meeting. Um, the vast majority of patients who get drug cessation trials, like so, so if you're an older person, over 60, and you have a new onset eczema, the vast majority of these patients got drugs removed from their drug list, like their blood pressure pill, their cardiac drug, their antibiotic or whatever. And we found that not one patient, at least in our sample, got better. Uh, although some medications have been associated with eczema eruptions like this, chronic eczema eruptions are highly unlikely to be medication driven. And what we did find was that several of these patients actually had harms occur because of the drug cessation trial. Uh, and so I'm not, I, and so, you know, I still consider medications as possible exacerbators or causes, but it's not very common. And you have to be very careful because it can harm patients. And so several patients had to be hospitalized actually when their cardiac medication was removed or even switched. And then there's other there's other rashes that dermatologists have to think about, like autoimmune rashes. This is an autoimmune blistering disease that we wouldn't want to miss. But you know, eczema does usually have big blisters like that. Uh, this is called bolus pemphigoid or blistering pemphigoid. It's an autoimmune condition that unfortunately happens in uh, in patients over over 70. And then there's these, this wastebasket, you know, chronic eczematous eruption of the elderly, you know, like what is that? And there's another one called uh, eruption of immune senescence, so like your immune system is going to sleep and then you get this rash. I personally think they're probably atopic dermatitis because a lot of them are responding to atopic dermatitis specific treatments, but we're still learning more. So research is evolving as we speak. Chronic eruption of the elderly. This went away with a with a drug called dupilumab. Um, so here's the the study that showed that there were some associations in in these chronic eczematous eruptions with these calcium channel blockers. Uh, for one, no other associations. But really, when you remove the calcium channel blocker, there's not a lot of data showing it helps the eczema. So there's some association studies, but they may not be causal. Um, and, and we've found in clinic that it just doesn't seem to be the case. I wish it was. Uh, and then this is what I'm talking about, about itch from a rash or itch from the inside. And this patient had itch from the inside. So you might look at this from, from afar and say, well, that's a rash. That's a bad rash. It's actually not. Those are just scratches. So when you look closely, you know, they're kind of well demarcated, geometric looking that you can't really do that from the inside of your body. So that means it's from the outside. Uh, whenever you see kind of geometric lesions like that, uh, and you don't see any redness or anything that's in between the scratches, you just see scratches and healed scratches. Um, and so then you know, as a dermatologist, okay, this is probably we have. I have to check the liver, kidney, blood count, and there's internal reasons for itch. And then it's the classic butterfly sign. So. There's, you know, you can't reach that part of your back and that, that part is clear. So that's kind of helpful, a uh, little hint. And then here's that cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And, you know, and so look on your left, you can see how that kind of looks like eczema, you know. And so if you, the interesting thing is early on, though, it doesn't itch much. And so that's a clue. The, the, uh, the waist and the hips uh, locations are also classic for cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. They can happen in eczema too, but classically, uh, they're uh, pronounced under the under the bathing suit, for example. 
Um, and so that's a good place to biopsy if needed. And then on your right, I don't think you'd be thinking atopic dermatitis there. Uh, so, of course, you biopsying that would be pretty uh, obvious that it's not atopic dermatitis. And so, uh, just some final words on making the diagnosis. Check medications. Consider stopping hydrocortisone or calcium channel blockers. I, I said that here, but I have new data now to show that it's probably not going to help, especially if it's been around for, you know, four months. It's most likely not going to be a medication. Uh, check products, even products you've used for 30 years can cause uh, allergic contact dermatitis, so don't think that th those are safe. Uh, repeated exposure causes allergy, so, uh, so anything is suspect. Uh, consider biopsy, consider re-biopsy, make sure we're in the right category. Uh, check for internal causes of itch, if there's minimal rash. And then sometimes you just got to say, look, we're going to call this provisional atopic dermatitis and we're going to treat it as such and see if I can get uh, my patient more comfortable. OK, so then just some challenges and I don't need to tell this audience about challenges and the burdens of atopic dermatitis. We have the burden uh, in kids and families and these are like, you know, we have the classic uh, allergies, asthma. Um, allergic comorbidities, food allergy, itch, pain, sleep, but these are kind of ones that aren't studied that much and talked about, but I still see in clinic in my kids and adults chasing the allergen, chasing the cause. Hey, I can't understand why this happened. I can't understand why this started. Why did this start at age 20? Why did it start at age 40? You know, the, the, and that's just like devastating and difficult to understand, and I don't understand it. But I also know that, there, you know, there's no cure, unfortunately, uh, but there's great ways to control it and get your life back. Um, complicated topical regimens. I say, hey, use hydrocortisone 2.5 on the face and tacrolimus ointment on the left arm and pimacrolimus cream on the right arm and trimcinolone on the left leg and clobetazole on the right leg. And, you know, it's like that's impossible. It's not feasible for a normal person. Um, and then, you know, some people say it's allergy, some people say it's medication. So these mixed messages causes lots of confusion and misunderstanding. Uh, problems with intimacy and embarrassment, stigma, workplace, post-work social. Uh, so just a number of things that happen in both kids and in our older patients. And you know this, mental health impact. Anxiety, depression, I get I get ADHD-like symptoms if I have poor sleep for two nights. You know, some people have poor sleep for 20 years. You know, how do they adapt to that? How can they brave that problem? It's just uh, mind-boggling sometimes to talk to patients who have somehow adapted to this. It's, um, and we know that a little bit of sleep disturbance can cause cognitive and memory impairment, as I just mentioned, the mood disturbances, and it can impact your immune system. You know, we have neuropeptides on your uh, receptors on your immune cells, as well as on your itch receptors. Um, and so all of that's tied together. I try to avoid the concept that stress is causing eczema. Because uh, I feel like that blames the patient and, and provides even more guilt. Uh, and I just don't think it's true. I think eczema causes uh, stress and it's a and it's a feedback loop and, and stress makes anything worse. Um, but, you know, solving becoming a yogi Zen master is I don't think is going to make your eczema go away. And so I don't feel like saying just, you know, decrease your stress. You'll be all right. You know, good luck on that one, especially these days. Okay, and then we'll do we'll finish up with some uh, challenges in treatment. I got about you know three minutes left or so. So, in mild disease, creams and ointments, it's the same you know treatment in older adults as it is for kids. Different issues you know sometimes, uh, but creams and ointments. Sometimes I, I go fancy like with expensive foams or sprays in my patients who just hate ointments, hate greasiness, or it's tough, tough. So there are other vehicles to deliver anti-inflammatories out there. So it's something to think about if you're, if that's one of the barriers to treatment. Um, but they're just more expensive usually, like they're trade name expensive stuff. Um, there's light treatment and there's pills and shots. 
So the topical steroids are still, you know, mainstay for a, a brief period to get things under control. And you can use twice a week topical steroids for long-term maintenance for years, if it's only twice a week. The problems come when you use them every day for years. That can thin out the skin or cause steroid withdrawal. So that's why we incorporate non-steroidal treatments. Those are fine to use uh, at any age and some combination of all those. And if they're not leading to good results or not feasible for you, then there's the International Eczema Council said, the only, the, the only determinant for, or the only criterion for getting um, a systemic treatment, meaning pill shots or, or phototherapy is not responding well to topicals. And so if you're not happy with topicals, I think you're a systemic candidate for you know, a number of reasons. And these are all the systemic treatments that are available that your dermatologist hopefully, or your dermatology provider hopefully is discussing with you. And there's gonna be four more this year. And so hopefully the NEA will have some Wednesday webinars on the new therapies as well. And this is how I uh, present uh, to my patients, you know, kind of the three most common systemic treatments, an immune suppressing drugs, top two, can be used safely, I say there's no side effect that's not reversible. So every side effect's reversible. So that's usually very comforting, um, but they have side effects. And the traditional immunosuppressants, cyclosporin and methotrexate, I think are a little bit more risky when, you, when you're older. And that's because cyclosporin has drug interactions. So older patients have more medications uh, and have potentially kidney toxicity. And so they also have reduced kidney function. So we have to be careful that you don't, I don't not use them, but I do use more methotrexate than cyclosporin in my older adults. And you have to do, uh, dose methotrexate accordingly to the, the kidney function of your patient, according to the age of your patient. But again, if you monitor labs, it's very safe. You can use these medications safely, uh, but just a little bit more risk in our older adults because of uh, kidney function and, and some more medications than average. And then dupilumab seems to be safe and effective uh, for older patients. It's just super expensive. And so access is the hardest thing, uh, especially for Medicare and even Medicare Part D, there's a big copay and out-of-pocket expense. So that's a real challenge for many of my patients. And this is just showing that chronic examinous eruption of the elderly happened to respond to dupilumab, which I think probably proves that chronic examinous eruption of the elderly is probably atopic dermatitis. So future therapies, there's gonna be new non-steroidal anti-inflammatory creams and ointments. Fortunately, some of those are coming out as of just recently. Um, there'll be more targeted shots like dupilumab and some new pills with uh, significant potential side effects that I think the JAK inhibitors are extremely powerful. They're pills, anti-inflammatory pills that I think are safer than cyclosporin, but in our older adults, I think they may uh, increase the risk of some, of some heart risk, um, some blood clots, uh, and, some, uh, and some serious infection. So that'll be something you'll have to talk very closely, carefully with your dermatologist. Is this the right medication for me as an older adult? Uh, and with my other um, medical problems, is this too risky for me? They're gonna come in two doses probably, so I, most likely in my patients over 65, for example, I would choose a lower dose if, if they have, don't, don't have some of the concerning uh, other medical problems. So final thoughts, so eczema is common and significant problem for patients over 65. A persistent itch and lack of sleep ruins retirement. Uh, diagnosis is difficult with some testing that may be required, including repeat biopsies. Um, if symptoms are still bad with creams and ointments, ask about other options. So pills, other than steroid pills, of course, light treatment or shots can bring your, um, your life back, uh, especially when you have moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. And advocate for yourself. We're going to advocate for you. Uh, and, and you and your doctor should both be making that uh, decision together. So uh, thanks so much for your attention. Happy to answer some, uh, some questions. Thanks so much for the presentation. We have a few uh, questions to get through here. All right. First up, 
Why does eczema appear in different places on the body in older adults? No idea. We don't. We have no idea about any any distribution of any rash in dermatology. Why does psoriasis go on the elbows and knees and scalp, and eczema goes on the opposite? I mean, there's uh, theories about like your microbiome is different in these different compartments of your body, so somehow your immune and microbiome interface might predict that. I don't think that's the case, um, but I actually don't know. Could be sweat uh, for our kids, but we, we, we really, it's a big mystery throughout all of dermatology. So thank you for giving me the hardest question right off the bat. Sure thing. Well, we'll see if this one's any easier. I've used topical steroids when my skin flares for over 40 years. Do I need to worry about thinning of skin in places I use topical steroids most? What does it look like and does it cause problems? Ah, see, Lauren, this is this is what I'm talking about. So I, I've been obsessed with patients interpretation of their skin lesions and misinterpretation sometimes and so i thank you for that question because i do feel like it might be helpful for the and let us know if, if you believe this to show pictures of what some of this looks like because sometimes patients will misinterpret uh let's say when when inflammation goes away and it starts scaling they'll think that that's skin thinning and so they'll stop the steroid too early uh, and then other patients don't recognize skin thinning, and then they keep, and then, and then it starts getting stretch marks in the thighs, for example, and it looks red, and they, oh, my eczema is coming back, and they keep treating it and makes the stretch marks worse. So I do feel like because this is a visible disease, like I, I feel like we need to educate patients about like all the differences of how eczema looks, because it does look so different in different stages, different stages of treatment in different locations. But to answer your question, um, just because you've used it for 40 years isn't bad. So it really depends on how they've been used for 40 years. So it's more nuanced than that. And so, and it's where they've been used for 40 years. So it really depends on frequency of use. So I would say the places that are most concerning for thinning are the, fle the folds uh, under the arms or near that, the thighs. Those are, the, these, these, this is the most common place. And it looks like cigarette paper skin. Um, for those of you who know what cigarette paper looks like, um, and very fine wrinkly. Um, but if you've used it intermittently, I find that even patients who use it for 40 years, I don't find uh, atrophy or thinning of the skin. Face is different. Face usually doesn't get thinning. It gets like steroid withdrawal or acne or these bumps around the eyes and around the mouth. Uh, so there are different side effects in different areas, but just because you've used it for a long time, I wouldn't be concerned um, as long as you're using it intermittently. Great. Why are there two names for this condition, eczema and atopic dermatitis? Yeah, right. Eczema uh, just means to boil over. It's like a Greek word, like your skin, like the bubbles. Uh, and so it's actually, so remember that as a, it's a classification of like many eczematous rashes. And so if it has visible eczema, then there's a number of things it could be. So if you just take a little patch of eczema, that could be numular eczema, that could be allergic contact eczema, it could be atopic eczema. So atopic eczema or atopic dermatitis, same word, is just one form of a broad eczema umbrella. And so the, we're at the National Eczema Association, and that's why it's not the National Atopic Dermatitis Association, it's the National Eczema Association because it has atopic dermatitis, but also has hand eczema and contact eczema and other eczemas within this organization, with atopic dermatitis being the most common and most important, I would say, uh, but, but that's why the name is National Eczema Association. Thank you for that one. If a child has bad eczema and it goes away for years, does it mean it will come back in an older age? Yeah, it does not mean that, no. And we have no, I'm, I'm just, I'm writing a grant right now trying to figure out why does some patients come, does it come back? And one of my hypotheses is, is that how you treat it early on, like in the first year of, of onset, may change your prognosis later on. 
And so, and so I'm wondering if aggressive treatment, like we see in rheumatoid arthritis, we found that aggressive treatment of early onset rheumatoid arthritis actually makes much better outcomes and remission later on. And so I'm wondering if it's the same thing for atopic dermatitis. Because I know people struggle along as kids or even as young adults with like, oh, I don't want to use too much steroid or I don't, and, and, they, and, they're, and they have smoldering disease for years. And, I'm, and my, I wonder, is that cause long-term disease or not? Um, but no, if, you, if it goes away, hopefully it's gonna stay away and we don't have any predictors uh, other than maybe like really bad eczema as a kid, it probably predicts it either coming back or it never going away. I have AD and rosacea. Are there any issues with using both protopic and metrogel on my face? No, that should be a fine combination. It's interesting because just remember topical steroids can cause rosacea. Um, and so, you know, it, and so your rosacea could be, if you happen to use topical steroids, hydrocortisone, like too much on the face, you'll get a rosacea, you can't tell the difference. It looks like rosacea. Biopsy looks like a rosacea, it's steroid rosacea. So, uh, so just remember that. Uh, and the good thing is if you happen to have steroid rosacea, doxycycline or an antibiotic actually can wipe it out. And then if you continue to use only protopic, then hopefully you'll never get the rosacea back. Next up, what medication can you use for scalp eczema? It's tough. It's really tough. There's no non-steroidal liquid. You know, it depends on your hair type. So some some hair types can take ointments or creams in the hair, fine. So then I would use steroids or non-steroidals. Uh, but if your hair is not compatible with an ointment or cream, uh, there are some topical steroid solutions that are um, that come in like a watery lotion. And I find those patients prefer those uh, because it just kind of sinks right into the scalp. So you can ask your dermatologist or provider for solutions or lotions formulations of your topical steroid oh, and there's even a shampoo actually there's a shampoo there's a mousse um, topical steroid here's another scalp question if i have scalp eczema what product is safe for hair dyeing and chemical hair straightening well anything that you're not allergic to so um go ahead and do whatever you want um for your hair uh, I don't think just having, I mean, I mean, I think, I think you'll know something's irritating your scalp. So, you know, maybe um, straightener or um, perm, permanent solutions might be irritating. Uh, if the hair dye has not irritated your scalp, like directly, when I say irritated, I mean like that day or the next day, it's just uh, painful. Um, then you're fine. I mean, that, I mean, you can use it as much as you can tolerate. The problem is if you ever develop an allergy and hair dye can be an explosive allergy. So it doesn't, you know, like a small percentage of population, but the more you get exposed, more expo at some point, very rarely, you'll get allergic to it. Uh, and, and that the chemical happens to be called paraphenylene diamine. And, it, and then once you, it's like putting poison oak all through your scalp. And then two days later, you're not happy. And then you'll always have to avoid that chemical and just, uh, there are hair dyes without that PPD chemical um, if you happen to get unlucky and get allergic to it. Can a product that has been used for 30 years still give rise to allergic contact dermatitis? Definitely. Definitely. That's what's so confusing. I even I tell my, even my residents, like, forget that. I said, they always say, they haven't changed anything I was like, don't ask what they've changed. I don't care about what they've changed. Tell me what they're using and what they've been using for 30 years, because that's what they're allergic to. And so there's like papers written on um, uh, hospitalizations and the amount of money wasted on neosporin allergy, uh, because it's so common and people use it on open skin. And so neosporin allergy is, is pretty darn common. We see it a lot. Um, and it can look like infection, or if you put neosporin on a wound, you know, it gets worse. Um, so yeah, anything is suspect. 
My skin has become sun sensitive. I break out in a rash in short periods, less than 30 minutes, even with sunscreen. Is this from the medication or disease? What can I do to prevent this? Yeah, I think, um, well, well, I mean, that's kind of like, you know, dog, my arms, if it hurts when I do this, you know, like I can say don't go outside, but I mean, that's kind of, you know, unreasonable. Um, to, and so, um, well, first, I, I, I am concerned. I, I'd say it's more, I don't think it's your, your atopic dermatitis. It's rare to have sun-induced atopic dermatitis. I haven't really run across maybe one or two cases. Um, and it's been described, but it's super rare. I think it's more likely if you're on a medication like hydrochlorothiazide or a blood pressure medication, and you all of a sudden become sun sensitive, that'd be the most likely uh, thing is a medication that you're taking. Um, so I would definitely talk to your physician about, uh, you know, are which ones, so you can look up your medication. So if you look up like on Google, uh, drugs that cause photosensitivity, uh, then that, you know, and see if your medications are listed on there at all and then talk to your doctor about switching it potentially. Dupilumab has been very effective for me for four years, except for conjunctivitis. How would you mm -hmm. treat this side effect? It has proved very difficult for me to deal with it. Yeah, it's um, it's the one Achilles heel, the, the most common side effect and the most annoying one. Um, fortunately, it's not site threatening. Um, you know, uh, the vast majority of the time, it's mild to moderate. It will go away. I have all, most of my patients who've had eye problems, it goes away with time. Uh, but I refer all my patients to uh, to an ophthalmologist to get um, to get evaluated and get treatment. So they'll give you anti-inflammatory drops. There's a whole there's like just like in dermatology, there's um, there's steroidal eye drops, there's non-steroidal eye drops, and they work really well. They make you feel much better. I think while you're waiting for an ophthalmology appointment, you can get some preservative free, like just lubricating eye drops, but really it's the anti-inflammatory eye drops that work so well. I, I've had some patients and ophthalmologists recommend the tacrolimus ointment, a trade name is Protopic, um, right along the eyelid margins or on your eyelids uh, or right on the margins. And some of that gets into your eye, which is fine. Like we use it in the eye, we use it in the mouth um, and that can actually help too while, while you're waiting for an eye appointment. Does taking or drinking probiotics still help for adults? You know, the, the uh, meta-analysis, which is a statistical method for combining all the studies, because if you just have one study of 100 people and it works, and then one study of 100 people said it doesn't work, it's, it's like it's too small of a, of a size to know, well, does it work or not? And so there's a way to combine all the studies together. Um, and uh, the treatment studies for eczema on probiotics, when you combine every study written, it's negative. Um, and so you can find positive studies out there, but when you look at, and then you find five negative studies. And so I don't really recommend it for my patients. Some patients take it because they, you know, looked at this YouTube or looked at this random channel. But when you look at the evidence, uh, it's conflicting. And, and when you combine it all, it's negative. Uh, there are some positive studies in prevention of eczema though. And the meta-analysis uh, meaning when you combine all the prevention studies, there's about a 20% reduction in eczema. So I think there's something to probiotics. I think it's just the effect is probably pretty small uh, for treatment. So it's not going to hurt you most likely, um, but it's probably don't count on it to like give you a huge beneficial effect. How do you know if you have rosacea on the face or if it's eczema? Uh, because rosacea shouldn't itch, and it looks like acne. It looks like little red bumps, like individual red bumps. And so, and they shouldn't weep, and they shouldn't itch. And okay. little, little pus bumps also. I'm in my 50s, and it seems like my skin gets more dry every day. What are effective ways to moisturize? Yeah, I mean, I just, I mean, a lot of it is environmental. Um, so, so you know, the hot shower thing, and then stop your dial and Irish Spring. I mean, it just that just takes all the lipids out of your skin. And as I showed in that one graph, your lipids decrease over time. Um, 
And so it's the heater, it's the hot water, and it's mainly like your detergents, uh, meaning like your soaps. So use a synthetic cleanser like CeraVe or Cetaphil um, that are like pump moisturizing cleansers. Those are better than true soaps. Um, true soaps probably have fewer ingredients, but uh, if it's a real soap, it's pretty harsh. Um, so the synthetic ones are better, or like a glycerin soap would be okay. But just minimize it. Kind of go to the dirty areas, like you know, below the waist and the armpits, really, and try to avoid lots of soap all over. And then the other thing is that we're you know we're probably bathing too much in general. So if you're taking two hot showers a day, try to go to one a day or even every other day, and just see, just see what happens. Should I see the same dermatologist now as I have my entire life? Are there certain dermatologists who specialize in eczema in older people? And if so, how do I find them? I have not seen an elderly eczema specialist. So I think anyone who has an interest in eczema, um, it's a good, it is a, a developing field is geriatric dermatology though. Um, and so I'm hoping, so I don't know who would be better. A, a, I think an eczema specialist over a, a you know gerontologist, as they say, you know, in dermatology. I think uh, because I think there's really unique features to 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 uh, understand in in atopic dermatitis in general. So I think anyone eczema friendly, uh, and Danny, you, you know, you guys might have some of these physicians on your list, um, but I don't think they're stratified by you know age interest. But. If you get eczema in private perineal areas, what medication can you use that will be gentle? So yeah, so I mean, you could use topical steroids, and especially in patients who are miserable, um, but for a brief period of time. So you know, for no more than two weeks straight, probably. Uh, and so if this is a chronic problem, which is you know a chronic problem and not that uncommon um, to have you know vulvar itch or scrotal itch. Uh, then it's nice to maybe start with steroid and then move to non-steroidal. So any of the non-steroidals, as long as you can tolerate them and without burning, um, should are fine. And those are preferred in, in those areas. We have a couple more questions to get through here. What humidity level do you recommend for the home, especially for winter? Yeah, there's absolutely zero data on the effects of indoor humidity and eczema outcomes um, and so I don't have I don't ha I don't even know what my own house is um, but I can imagine that 20% is probably not that good um, uh, and it, it, yeah I don't know I have no idea the answer to that question um, and I do have some patients that tell me in the winter time they put on their humidifier um, and that seems to help. So I don't know if it gets up to 40% or, yeah, I just don't know the answer to that. I'm, never, I'm very sorry. No worries. Let's see if you know this one. Do you know how they discovered coal tar derived from coal stop for stopping the itching of skin? The question has been bugging me. <laughs> well, that's a good question. I have no idea about the, about the history of coal tar. You can ask the same question. I don't want to bug you anymore, but how do they find strychnine and, uh, you know, and, and other poisons actually worked in uh, arsenic, works in, in atopic dermatitis. So I think they did all kinds of weird things back then, um, but they actually, they probably do work. Um, and and coal tar has 10,000 different chemicals in it. Um, and so, um, yeah, I don't know how they found it. It'd be an interesting webinar, historical webinar. We'll add it to the list. <laughs> uh, will oatmeal baths work for eczema? And then follow up from that, does emu aid or manuka honey work? <laughs> um, so the, you know, anything that, there'll be, remember, there's things that soothe eczema. So, you know, when you say, does it work for eczema? Well, it's soothing, but it doesn't treat eczema. And so remember that there's two different, you know, so like someone will say, well, the cream, it just, it didn't work, doc, you know, um, well, it's because the moisturizer is not going to treat the inflammation or, you know, the, the cream didn't work because it burned when I put it on. Well, that's just tolerability. So 
there are things that feel good or feel bad. And then there's things that like, for example, tacrolimus ointment feels bad. So people say, oh, it's irritating, you know, but if you use it long enough, it'll treat the eczema. Um, so yeah, oatmeal baths are soothing, um, but they're not going to treat it. Um, then the other, the, the, the honey and the, uh, which one? Emu aid. Oh, emu oils. I always, I like to, you know, Auntie Emma always recommends emu oil. Um, so it, again, it's like, it's soothing. And, and there's, you're always going to have, someone's always going to say, hey, try this. It worked for my kid. Uh, and, and they had mild eczema. And like, if you put butter on it, it's going to go away or, you know, Vaseline or anything. Uh, and so they think, well, then it should work for you. You know, why, why aren't you trying this? Uh, but it's just like, I just kind of nod my head. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for that emu oil. But like, you're, they don't understand that. Like, you have severe inflammatory problems. Um, and and there's such a variety of severities that people mean well and they want to do 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 well, but uh, I have no data on emu oil versus other moisturizers in terms of effect on eczema. Okay, we have one more question here. Eucrisa, I heard is effective, but it stings. What can be mixed with Eucrisa to be less burning? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's funny because the clinical trial showed four percent uh, burning, but like in my patients, it's like forty percent burning. Um, so you have a common problem. Um, I think you could. I, I don't know if mixing it's going to help. It's going to dilute it more. It already has kind of weak effects. Um, so I, I think maybe trying to calm the eczema down with a couple of days of topical steroid and then switching to Eucrisa would be your only option. And if that doesn't work, um, then you'll have to scratch that one off your list, I think. Uh, and there, there's a new, uh, I'm an investigator consultant for it, but there's a new, there's a new non-steroidal cream that again, they, they showed like 2% burning. So I don't know if it's gonna also burn in clinic like Eucrisa, but it's a completely different molecule. Um, and it's ridiculously priced. I mean, I just find out the price. Um, but it is a not so, but if you use it like just in one small area, hopefully it'll last you for a long time. Um, it's, it's, it's called a topical Ruxolitinib. Um, it's a topical jack inhibitor. It just got approved like a few days ago by the FDA. And it's actually, the interesting reason why I like it is because the phase two studies, early phase studies showed it was equivalent to a, a medium potency topical steroid. So that'd be the strongest non-steroidal that we have. So I'm, I'm excited about the drug. I wish it didn't cost so much. All right, that's, that's it for our questions. Thank you so much for this presentation and for helping us get a better understanding of eczema and aging. And many thanks to you all for joining us today. You can continue your eczema education on our website at nationaleczema.org. You may register for one of our upcoming webinars or watch the recording of a previous webinar at nationaleczema.org slash webinar dash Wednesdays. Uh, once again, I'm Danny Morshead on behalf of the National Eczema Association. Thanks so much for joining us.